dedicated to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? It's Monday. Let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or savor a bottle. And let's begin exploring the wine glass. Today, I am excited to share detente wines with you. I had the pleasure of visiting Chris Everly and Trevor Eva on site at their very cool tasting room in Norma's Alley in downtown Paso Robles. These wines are among my favorites and the story behind the label is fantastic. If you enjoy exploring the wine glass, I'd appreciate you giving me some love by taking two minutes out of your day to write a review on whatever app you're listening to. It is the best way to support the show. And if you would like to keep up on everything Exploring the Wine Glass, please sign up for the newsletter at exploringthewineglass.com. Slancha. Hey everybody, I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, someday service, champagne specialist, and WSET level two graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time to swipe, subscribe, rate, and review. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. No, no, no. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracita Wines. This is your host, Lori, and today I get to be on remote here at Detente Winery in Paso Robles with Chris Eberly and Trevor Eba. So welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the silence, they're waving because we're actually trying to uh, video this on my iPad. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so anyway, tell me about Detente. So first of all, the name. Uh, well, I, I guess we could start back in like 2000, Eight, where I kind of came up with the concept for a brand. Um, so back then I was the assistant winemaker at Everly, and I think you were at Everly at that time. Yeah, right? I started in 2008 as well. And, um, you know, in Paso Robles, there's kind of this, there's sort of this divide, or at least there was back then more so than there is today, where um, kind of perceived quality versus what actually, what quality is actually out there. And so, you know, the West Side had always been perceived to have better quality, um, but I think it was only perceived quality because of bottle prices and stuff like that. Um, so I got this idea of like East versus West sort of thing. And I'm a little bit of a history buff. So um, for me, one of the most interesting uh, points in our history, in US history, and maybe world history, is the Cold War. And so, um, you know, that's also an east-west rivalry slash divide, whatever. And so, um, kind of use concepts from the Cold War and imagery from the Cold War. And like, you can look at our bottles and you see like this, not so much war, but like espionage and like all the kind of stuff that was happening during that time, uh, spying and um, nuclear threat and all that kind of stuff, Bay of Pigs. Um, so yeah, we incorporate all that stuff in there and uh, I think it was like 2016, I came to Trevor and I was like, hey man, what do you think of this idea? And he's like, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, yeah. whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, we kind of started with just uh, a little bit of Pinot and just sold it to family and friends and that's how the, <laughs> the initial, you know, spark got lit and uh, yeah, from there obviously it's developed into this wonderful brand that we have now, which is much more developed than just uh, one skew of Pinot. So that, that's how a lot starts, right? You start making the wine and, you know, your friends and family are like, oh, this is really good. You should do this. You know, but you were really, Chris, you were already really doing we it. Were in real life. Yeah. yeah. Um, but not for yourself, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, and then you get that little spark in your head. Oh, well, they liked it. I, maybe I'll go a little bigger. Maybe I'll go a little bigger. And, well, then, <laughs> and then the name, the name was like, we were trying to come up with ideas for the name and yeah. We finally came up with detente, but there was a winery. Should I say this? You can. Can I say that there was a winery that had our name? I'll tell you. So did we? Oh, there. So there was a. There's a brand down south that had a label um, called detente, but it was like oh. a, it was like a one or two vintage thing. It wasn't uh, like a full blown brand. So uh, we do have the trademark on detente, and, and their trademark had lapsed. Oh, and, good uh, timing. Actually, they never had one. 
Oh, they never did. Oh, yeah. okay. So oh. We're, we're the only detente uh, trademark for wine. So oh. yeah, so there's plenty of other detente trademarks for other uh, industries, but uh, yeah, not in the wine. So okay. yeah. see, you were like, let me check. Let me let me check if this can come out of my well, mouth or not. Be careful, <laughs> yeah. like we for said a while. the name, and we're like, oh crap, there's a label down in I think it's Tensley that had it. Yeah, down, down south. Oh. Uh, and then, I think. And we're like, oh crap. And so we did a lot of research, and then uh, actually called them up. They're like, oh, we're not going to make this anymore. Oh. And it, it had been made uh, like over ten years prior. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It was a, a while back, so it mm-hmm. wasn't uh, right. anything they sold out in the market. I think they said they did it for. Um, uh, kind of their, their wine club, they they actually came up with the idea that they, they they sourced grapes from France and then grapes from California and blended those two oh, together. Wow. And that was their detente oh. was uh, between between actual nations of wow. grape growers. So theirs yeah. was like an actual like coming together. Yeah, was just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right, right. Yeah. So for those who are listening who don't know what detente means, it's actually a relaxing of strained relations. So that whole east side, west side, Paso thing, which is a freeway that divides us. Yeah. Um, yes, but so we kind of had the same thing with Dracina wines. We wanted to call it Grey Ghost Cellars. Oh, okay. And because Weimaraners are known as Grey Ghosts. Okay. So we went through the proper channels and found that there was a Grey Ghost winery in Virginia. Mm. And... I, it's another country. Yeah, right? <laughs> right? And uh, the thing is, is that it wasn't even a dog. Apparently, there was, um, during the Civil War, there was a person who's, who was known as the Grey Ghost because he was a double spy. Is that what it's called? Like, he oh, was a yeah. spy for both. Double uh, agent. Double agent. Yeah. He was a double agent, so they called him the Grey Ghost. So all of their labels are all Civil War, military, and we're a dog. <laughs> and so I called them and, I, you know, I said, you know, because we didn't want to go down that route and then get yeah. in trouble. Yeah. And he was like, nope, absolutely not. We will go after you. Yeah, I'm like, rude. but we're a dog yeah. and you're a war. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I bet, like, that. you know, within maybe 10 years, they might be like, oh, wait a minute, there's another winery called... Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And at that point, you, you don't, don't want to rebrand. You don't want to go through that. Yeah. I've right. been through yeah. that yes, at that's, another winery. And yeah. I won't that say is the not a pretty fit, right? But it was ugly and it sucked. And um, yeah, it was it was not a fun thing to be on the receiving end of that uh, trademark dispute. Yeah. But I'm happy because I think Detente is an awesome name for Paso. I, yeah. Think, yeah. I think it is perfect. And I agree. When years ago, I think there was much more of that. Yeah, that I would say it's pens. not so much anymore, but I mean, it's still, it's still sort of there. I think a lot of more consumers come into town thinking like there's better quality, better wine on the west side when actually the majority of the fruit grown in Paso is on the east side. Right. Um, but now there's a lot of money going into the east side. Uh, you know, we've got like Austin Hope who's producing higher priced wines. We've got Jay Lore, uh, Everly as well. And so I think it's, that divide isn't there as much, but it still works with the brand. It does. It does. I like it. And even the website is really cool. So, like, it's all, like, spy type. Thanks, Julian you know? Custerton. <laughs> oh, all right. There's a good shout out. Uh, he's, he's our third partner in this. Oh, okay. And he's a graphic designer. I've known him since uh, sophomore year of college. And uh, so all the designs, websites, he did all that stuff. I thought it was really cool when I went onto the website. It's like all, it's like, you know, so yeah. like it's, you know, secret information yeah. and things we, like that. I've definitely received feedback from people that have come into the tasting room and said, you know, we, we just Google searched, uh, you know, Paso wineries or, or maybe narrow it down to downtown Paso wineries. And they were just going through everyone's website and they said, you know, we went to your website and we said, we absolutely have to go here. And they, and they searched us out. And obviously coming down the alley is a little bit difficult to find us on foot. And, uh, you know, we've had people come in and just say, man, you guys, your guys' website is so different than anybody else's. We just had to see what it was all about. So yeah. I think it's a very important part of our brand as well. Yeah, I think it's great. I think it's great. So now... I'm not paying you anymore, Julian. <laughs> <laughs> I'll support it, Julian. All right, we good? <laughs> um, so let's talk about the origin stories. So Trevor, how about you? How did you... You met at Eberly. You both met at Eberly? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Chris had been there for a few years already. Um, we had yeah. similar, similar interests drinking. 
There you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I grew up in Oxnard, Ventura area. I went to school in Riverside and then moved up to Paso after college. Uh, my family, we've been coming up here uh, since I was younger. We had a vacation home at Lake Massimiano. So that's kind of like how our family made it this direction. So in college, my parents kind of like semi-retired, um, was working part-time. Um, and decided to move up here full time. So they, they bought a new house up here. And when I graduated from college, it was a nice recession in 2008, and I couldn't find a job down south. And uh, not that I wanted to stay in Riverside either. Um, <laughs> so I, I essentially moved back home, but my home hadn't moved from Oxnard up to here. So moved back in with my parents for a while. I was looking for a job. Um, uh, you know, I tried really hard all summer looking for a job, even though I maybe was on the lake water skiing every day. Um, and I started at Everly actually as a temp. Uh, I was just looking for any kind of, you know, accounting or finance uh, type position. And uh, at the time, Everly's accountant was on maternity leave and she had gone on like an early maternity leave, uh, with, I think some mild complications with pregnancy. And so she was gonna be gone for at least six to eight months. And so they needed somebody to come in at least for, you know, close to a year. And so I signed up through like a, it was pretty much a temp agency in town that, that, that made the placement. And um, so that's, that's kind of how I started there and, and met Chris um, and all the other crew. And, and it was, you know, my first job out of college. So, you know, I was very green and fresh and nude and everything. And uh, yeah, I think we, we made friends pretty quickly, especially after he found out I lived on the lake and had access to a boat. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> It was yeah. more of the ping pong table at his parents' house. Yeah. And, you know, oh. That kind of stuff. Parents like lots of toys. Yeah. True ping pong or beer pong? <laughs> oh no, we played true well, ping pong. Both. Both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the beer pong. I think we played on another, another apparatus during those days. Cheaper. Yeah. Table. Something that could get wet and disgusting Good and thing. gross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, I, after starting Everly, and uh, the accountant that I was replacing for that time being said that you know, hey, I want. I don't want to come back. I want to stay home with my kid and, and raise a kid. Yes. And, I, and then I was offered a job full time. So pretty much been there ever since. Um, I did do uh, two years at another winery here in town um, when uh, Gary Everly kind of lost, uh, lost the winery in a big hostile takeover shakeup. So I kind of left during that time. And then uh, that was when Chris came back to town and, and Gary brought me back in. So yeah, we kind of, um, a similar path in the sense like he started at Everly a little bit before me I started at Everly and he left and traveled the world and did a lot more fun things and then you know I stayed there the whole time and left for a short stint and went like a mile and a half down the road <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so I went to Australia right you were in Australia yeah so Australia Lake Nascimento not quite the same <laughs> yeah, I mean, culturally, not that different. Uh, <laughs> so what about your, your background? Was it always, I'm going to do wine? No. Um, so I was born in Whittier, California. <gasps> I am a poet. I graduated <laughs> from Whittier. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. I didn't know <laughs> that. No idea. I moved from, away from there when I was seven. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, 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 the only thing I remember of Whittier is that Richard Nixon went there, yes. which also is a word he used during the Cold War when yeah. detente to refer to Russia and the U.S.'s relationship anyways. Yes. Um, so we left after the, the Whittier Narrows earthquake, which I think was 87. 87, because I was a freshman. Okay. And I was in the dorm that used to be the maternity wing. And there used to be ghost stories that there were ghosts in there. So there I am, freshman year, and the mirror starts going back and forth. And I'm like, there are ghosts! There are ghosts! Little did I know, you know, the, what did I do? Go right to the window to go look at everything shaking outside. <laughs> the safest place to be. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm sorry. You left Whittier very early. I mean, I remember the earthquake. I mean, it was, I was watching Fraggle Rock. And uh, my mom grabbed me off the couch and went under a, you know, there's an archway in the, in the hallway. And we just kind of stood there, my mom, myself, and my little sister. And like, it looks like the whole house is going to come down. And mm -hmm. the chimney actually didn't come down. But, uh, and then I slept like three nights under the coffee, not the coffee table, the dining room table. Because there was like, there, there was three days of aftershocks. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was pretty wild. And like, there's some big ones in there. Yeah. <clears throat> so then after that, my parents were like, hey, I'm <laughs> yeah, like we're, we're done with this. So then we moved up near Chico, okay. California, and we were there for another seven years. And then we moved to Modesto, okay. California, Central Valley. 
did my high school years there, then went to Cal Poly. Oh, all right. And so my, my mom managed restaurants most of her career. Um, so I, at 13, I was washing dishes. I was waiting tables by the time I was, could serve wine, which I think back then was 18. Yeah. I think it still is now, as long as it's a, a, an established eatery. Yes. Yeah, Did you eat. just not take the RBC class? He has not yet taken his oh. RBS. I refuse. I refuse. Take- <laughs> right back the record. I refuse. He has taken it. He's yeah. just forgotten Stay everything there is. Yeah. Jack. <laughs> um, anyways. Uh, so, uh, so when I was going to Cal Poly, I was working at Hoppy's, which is at the time was, was the best uh, restaurant on the Central Coast, uh, hands down. And, uh, you know, Chef Hoppy, he went to, he was trained at Hyde Park, New York. Oh, wow. I mean, like, amazing. And uh, he had a wine list of like 2,000 bottles. There was a cellar underneath the restaurant. It was in Cayucas. So it was at the old way station. Really beautiful spot. Um, and then, so working there, working the bar, working tables, you meet winemakers drink good wine and uh, and so at the time I was ag business watch that tail I was ag business um, and viticulture and in 2005 I did a harvest at Claiborne and Churchill and then after that I was I don't know if I was hooked because I, I spent most of that harvest just washing stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> and but I, I enjoyed the work you know punch downs and like the, the grunt work of it I mean that harvest I think Everyone was stung like 17 times by bees and somehow I never got stung. So I was like, mm, okay. Uh, shadowing of a yeah, exactly. Hours. This is something. And so um, I liked it enough to like keep going. And um, then I graduated the next year from Cal Poly and then got a job with Everly as a seller at. And then worked two years, moved up to assistant winemaker. And in 2009, I decided to go travel and work abroad. And I mean, before then, I'd never been outside of the states of Mexico, and my first job was in South Africa, so it was like, it was a pretty big change. And then, uh, so I went to South Africa, New Zealand, uh, Germany, straight. Wow. Spent about four months in South Africa, six months in New Zealand, and almost six months in Germany. And then I came home for about a month to say hello to everyone. <laughs> then off to Australia, uh, Mar River. Western Australia, and uh, met my future wife there, and then we came back to the States to do a harvest in Sonoma at Duval, up in Windsor. Okay. Then, sh- let's see, that was 2000, so 2011, I mean, we were still coming out of the recession, so jobs were still pretty tough to come by, and so with us, we'd only been together for, Tessa and I, we'd only been together for maybe nine or ten months, and so we had to either get married if she wanted to stay, oh. or we can go back to Australia on a partner visa, which is much easier. Um, so we decided to do that, so I went back. The visa was approved before I went to France to do Harvest, and she came over. Then I went back to Australia, and then I was there for another four years, and then Gary Everly called me in 2015 to come back and be his winemaker. Wow. So within three weeks, I quit my job, left my future wife, which <laughs> she, she came eventually. <laughs> And, it was a uh, test. It was a test. It was a test to see if yeah. she truly loved you. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to leave you here. Yeah. You know, set it free if it comes back. Back. Really right <laughs> she came back. And um, and I arrived in Paso two weeks before harvest started. Wow. And went right to work. Right to work. Right to work. Yeah. Wow. That's well, that's pretty impressive getting a phone call. But, well, you know, it, was from... a, it was a Facebook uh, message. Oh, okay. I'd yes. imagine Gary wouldn't be awake during the times that you would be awake. But no, it's we had, we had pretty far, yeah. 15 hours. Oof. So we, we had, when we finally talked on the phone, it was like, I think it was my morning. morning. It was, yes. Wow. Yeah. There's like some, because I've interviewed Australia, there, there's like that, la, that period yeah. where yeah. it's not hours. too late. Yeah, it's not yeah. too late for them or not too early for them and not too late for you yeah. type type thing. But, most, but it's a very small window. Yeah. But most Aussies, are on the east coast the west coast is a little further behind oh okay um so yeah he messaged me asked me what i was doing with my life sort of thing <laughs> just like, uh, out of the blue you're kind of fishy yeah. <laughs> and, that's what's going on here. and that's when i called uh jimmy yeah. one of our friends who had also worked at everly like man what's going on with something going on with gary and the winery he's like oh yeah 
well, this whole thing happened with the takeover. Yeah. Now it looks like he might be getting it back. I had, I had no idea this had happened, so I kind of figured at that point he was looking for right. a winemaker. And you're like, all right, we can talk. All good. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do it. But it always intrigues me um, how people can do that. Like, I'm just going to get up and I'm going to go to another country and work a harvest. Like, you know, and I think it's, I don't know, because I've never done it, but I would think now it's a little bit easier because of how small the world is with the internet or whatever. Sure. But, Travel, yeah. you know, but back back then, and not that that's so long ago, but there was a difference. Like, how do you find those jobs? How do you willingly say, I don't really know what I'm getting into, but I'm going to go? Well, I think in the end, you just, you just do it. Good. What's the worst that can happen? Fly um, back, I guess. You know, right? it's, it's going to be experience, yeah. an experience either way. But when I went to South Africa, I had already had my job lined up in New Zealand. So, like, even if I totally failed, like, I'm on to the next place. Mm-hmm. But I had, I had met the guy that I worked for, Paul Schultz, fantastic winemaker um, at Hardenberg Estate in Stellenbosch. I met him like two years before at Everly. He was touring oh. California. And I, I, I messaged him and I was like, hey man, I've got a job at another winery. What do you think of this place? He's like, oh yeah, it's pretty good, but come work for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know, it okay. couldn't have ended up that bad. Like I right. got a really good start with people I knew sort of right. uh, in the first place and then you know, going on to New Zealand. Like it's such a, New Zealand was such an easy sort of place to travel and everyone was pretty welcoming and nice. And, Germany was fun as well, and it's a little harder. Like I have a German passport, so if I didn't, it would have been very difficult as an American to, you know, go through the whole process to get a job there. Oh, so okay. it was easy for me. Um, and he was out of school, so right. also what what could go wrong? Right. Uh, Do you yeah. speak German? Not really. No. I took three <laughs> years. I took three years in in high school. My dad's right. actually from Germany. Oh, okay. Um, but growing up, they they spoke mostly English in the house. When I was around my grandparents, they would speak German. But when I was there for like, by the time a month rolled around, I could understand most conversations, but I was still like a little hesitant to speak. To it. speak. Right. I just mostly listen. But everyone spoke English. Mm-hmm. Like, almost everybody. Yeah, it's amazing. The Americans, we expect everybody to speak English. Yeah. You know, we'll go to their country and yeah. expect them to speak our language. Well, that's not, you know, I tried. And right. so when I try to speak German, they're like, oh, no, no. It's no, okay. just go English. <laughs> <laughs> just go English. It's all right. It's all right. I want to practice. All right. So we are at Everly. You guys are both at Everly. And you're like, I'm going to start. I want to start my own label. So how do you go to, how, how does that happen? Are you yeah, using? The big man wasn't too uh, yeah. keen on the idea. Oh. It took some, some lunch meetings, I think. We took a nice lunch at, uh, at uh, Bistro La Ronde. Yeah, I think we went oh. to Bistro twice. Did we? Maybe. Uh, must, uh, um, I mean, I mean, that was. He's a smart man. Why? Why agree on the first time when if I can get a second round out of it? Well, uh, <laughs> he, he, he can get a free lunch whenever he wants. Exactly. Either way, either way, it was good for us. We got a nice lunch. Uh, either way, when I pulled out my credit card, it was the Everly credit card. That I was so, uh, uh, and I'm pretty sure he handed the receipt straight to me and said, "Yeah, yeah, it's on you guys. It's on you um, No, it took some convincing and. I think Gary kind of came to the realization that not that we would leave because he wouldn't allow us to do this, but you know, he thought that we might be a little um, hissy or sort of a uh, little upset, begrud- yeah. begrudging or yeah. whatever. Disgruntled so, or disgruntled. Or... So he was like, "Okay, let's just you guys can do it. Um, you know, keep your production low, keep it out of sight, out, out of mind." Kind okay. Of thing. Um, so I think yeah, that was his main reservation was that we, we were if we were to become successful quickly that we would take that and say oh you know thanks for all the years thanks but for the see you later. we got our own thing going now and, and we're fine uh, and that was never our intention with it you know y- yes it would be great if we were making that much money where we could make that decision if we wanted to um, obviously opening two and a half months before the pandemic hit, um, pretty much threw that right out the window. But, um, you know, I think even if we were in that, that spot, that, that wasn't really what we were going for with the brand, right? You know, it was, it was to be 
in addition to our regular jobs. You know, we, right. we both have houses and mortgages and car payments and- California's not cheap. It's not cheap to live here. Um, you know, my wife's a teacher, she makes zero dollars. I'm sure anybody that's in education <laughs> can tell you that. And she left a very lucrative job in biotech to become a teacher. Um, and so, you know, that, that kind of is in the back of your head of like, well, what else can we do to make a little extra money to supplement that income? Right. Luckily, like, we don't have kids like uh, Chris and Tessa do, and so like our expenses aren't aren't as crazy. But I mean, yeah, we moved a couple years ago, and our mortgage quadrupled from what it was before, and right. and that's just the nature of living <laughs> and in California. And a much smaller, yeah. and a much smaller house. Oh, exactly, right? yeah. And so I think with 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 that in mind, you know, our idea with with if we did have success with the brand, it was it was to replace you know that income. And, and his wife Tessa was working at Halter Ranch, and then after the kids came, you know, she was not working full time there and it was like well man what do, what do we what do we do here what do we what do we do to make up that income and i think we were both on the same page with that of hey this can be a good way to do it and you know i mean obviously that curveball of covid definitely shook things up quite a bit you know we were hoping to have success a little bit quicker than we are and we were hoping to have you know this place staffed a little bit easier and obviously we all know staffing is yes so insanely hard. It's it is. so easy to find somebody who wants to work these days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just, we just, uh, one of our other guys that was working for us, he, he was moving back east and, and he wasn't supposed to leave until November. He ended up leaving last weekend. Oh. And, you know, somebody that he had lined up to replace him, she can't do it now. And, and so oh, it's just last night. So what? she texted me last night and now we're, I do have one other person that could possibly work You that. heard it first here. <laughs> You know, it's just one of those things where- Does anybody just, need a job? Yeah, if you need a job, we need people, but- uh, Tips are pretty good. So that just ends up with, with us being in here a lot more often mm-hmm. than, than we had hoped for. So, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice if we get this place staffed and, and see that growth continue to go as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, talking about that being Gary's, you know, concern or worry about it, uh, it's, 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 again, it's, it's never that been an issue. our right. intention and our issue. And right. so I think, I wish that he really saw that that if if Detente was uber successful, that, that that's just going to bring up Everly as well. It's the same winemaker. He owns this brand. He's the winemaker at Everly. You know, if, if Detente has success, that means Everly has even more success than it already does. So right. It doesn't necessarily work in the other direction. No, and it unfortunately, it doesn't. Yeah. Well, Everly I do believe success, some winemaker sitting right success. here just won Best of Show in the San Joaquin. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a pretty small competition, so it's... It's, it's still best of show, yeah, baby. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Still best yeah, of show. Yeah, she doesn't work the other way. It doesn't that, really, right? Doesn't, yeah, Everly gets best of show, but Detente gets nothing. Yeah. But if Detente got a best of show, I'm sure Everly would see some residual yeah, for that. Yeah, absolutely. But I think, um, you know, creating Detente was for sure to, to get some extra income, but also, like, I never started my own business, so I never built up a brand, I never done any of that kind of stuff that I kind of trained for and learned in school and never really applied it. Um, so I mean, it was also, for me, it was a lot of that as well. Right. Right. And so back 2020 pre-pandemic, what did you start with? What uh, wine did you start with? The Margo Pinot, which uh, is named after my daughter. Oh, okay. This one here nope, is one. That's not. Oh, the search. The word search. <laughs> the uh, so she was born in 2017, and that was our first vintage. So, you know, we thought it was fitting to name a wine after her, and Margaret and Pina you know, goes together rhymes mm-hmm. pretty well. And then the other one was the classified, which was um, we had a half barrel of Grenache, and we had a half barrel of Pina left over. I'm like, yeah, you know, they're pretty similar. Let's just throw it together, and um, it turned out to be pretty damn good and you know I dare anyone to go find a Grenache Pinot blend you won't find it unless you come to us so there you go you've got to come here so that is awesome and again the labels are so cool I mean there's so much cleverness behind everything about the winery I think it's it's really it's hard these days to come up with a name (laughs) to come up with labels to do branding like it almost feels like everything's been done and if you do come up with a good idea crap someone already has it or whatever so I I think we definitely have one of the more creative labels and branding in Paso from what I've seen yeah Um, so yeah we're we're, we're super proud of of that for sure yeah and I think it's that that top to bottom like 
that continuity between the idea behind the brand that goes into the labels. It's not just a, hey, this label's different because it's it's artsy. You know, that, that, that's, that's great that it's creative because, uh, it, you know, somebody is an artist and, and just has this beautiful idea of, of a, you know, watercolor expression on it. That's beautiful in its own sense. But when, when we look at our labels and we, we talk with Julian, um, you know, we, we have the idea of, well, why do we want this label to look like that? Well, it's because this part of the brand, you know, it, it fits within the whole Cold War aspect, the East versus West aspect, the, you know, it, it has to draw from something like that. Um, and, and I think that that's something that we do a, a lot better than even some of the more creative brands around the area. And it's definitely something that Julian's really good at is, uh, so, you know, we'll come up with an idea for a label well, why do you want to do that? <laughs> well, because of this. No, that doesn't work. Yeah. Well, why? And he'll tell us. And then often he makes a lot of sense. And yeah. so, I mean, that's his job. He does this all day long. Yeah. And so, you know, to make everything cohesive, I mean, he was a big, a big part of that. Oh, huge. Yeah. 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 You know, and it's one thing for us, you know, I'm not, I'm not very artistic, uh, but I could see something in my head of like, hey, you know, this would be really cool, but I, I don't even know how to like explain what that would look like and, and we would give him just like the most vague base of like an idea and then he'd come up with this and we're like oh yeah that's exactly that's what that's yeah. exactly that's what I wanted. that that is exactly, exactly what, I, what I knew we were yeah. doing yeah. well yes. for instance like the the peanut label um the the uh, word search the word search yeah. the enigma, enigma, enigma code, enigma code. Yeah. um it's i think it was like two days before we we're going to go to to print the bottles yeah he's like i don't like my original idea here's this one and actually, none of us liked the original, but it was yeah, all that we had. Like that. And then he gave that to us like two nights before, and we were all like, "Yes, yeah. that's it." And then so it changed everything. Yeah. So the well, letters, was... I so you can see that the Margot is like bold. So that's how the spelling is. But are the other letters just complete random? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Or is there a, any a other too meaning? random on our first print because uh -oh. there was words like. You know, people thought it was a word search, and they yeah. came up. With well, that's like, what I was like. Oh, yeah. it's a word search. That's Margo. <laughs> yeah, there was like there were some words in there. We probably shouldn't have been touching together. I don't know if there yeah. was one with like but. I think yeah, <laughs> it wasn't anything too bad. Yeah, it, it wasn't too bold. And so now Julian makes sure like he'll look through and make sure nothing is like right. spells anything weird or whatever. So it's not a word search. What did you call it? Enigma code. Okay, so. How, what is an Enigma code? Uh, it's something they used in World War II to send messages. And I think originally, no, no, wait, no. The Enigma code was something they used to decipher messages that the Germans were using. Yeah, the Germans were using. Uh, yeah, so the Enigma yeah. code is, is what they used to crack the... Uh, so it was like, it's a Rosetta uh, Stone for, for yeah. countries, kind what of? What was the movie yes. with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch? Yeah. And, no, not the he was the, the one that cracked the code. I forgot what the name of that movie is called. Probably know that. I should know that, but I, I forgot. It's a great movie. If you, yeah. you could find it somewhere. Sure, Google it. it. Yeah. We'll think of it up. And now, a word from our sponsor. Looking to be in the know about Dracaena Wines? Want to be the first to know about our new releases and special offers? All you need to do is sign up for our newsletter. There is no commitment necessary, and I promise you we won't spam your mailbox with loads of messages. Need another reason to sign up? Quite possibly the best reason? You'll immediately get a discount code for 10% off your first purchase and be privy to newsletter-only discounts. Let Dracaena Wines turn your moments into great memories. Visit our website, www.dracaenawines.com, or use the link in show notes to sign up. It will take you less than a minute, but the rewards will last a lifetime. So the, we just recently went to Hawaii. And so at Pearl Harbor, you know, there's that museum that talks you through. And that there was, you can play with the code. Uh, wow. It was like one of the hands-on things for the kids that, of course, I was playing with, you know, but. <laughs> you know. Well, it's like if you took that and put it on something flat, I mean, that's kind of what, that is. what it would look like. See, everything is all clever. All right, so let's talk more wine here. Okay. Um, so Western Block, Western Block. Talk about this guy. So uh, that is a, what vintage is that? It's a 2020. 2020. 2020. 
So that is a field blend, meaning okay. that we picked it all together all at once. So the varieties in there are Granada Sral Graciano. Uh, that is from the Colburn Vineyard, and is, he planted us was specifically. It was it Moved? Uh, yes. <laughs> so we, we, we were a part of the whole Moved debacle, but we did have the opportunity to say, uh, no, we'll wait for the Moved, but it would have been another year, and so that would have been a year without production. And I've worked with Graciano before in I love Australia, it. and yeah. I, I, yeah, I really loved it as well. And uh, it's like, nah, leave it, leave it planted, we'll, we'll, we'll take it, it's fine. It's a good story. Yeah. That's and, a little uh, character to pass out because yeah. there's not enough here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's something to talk about. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, field blend. It's it's our it's our big boy wine. Like all of our wines are pretty uh, balanced, lower alcohols. This one is it's it's, it's our big big guy. It's still quite balanced though on the finish. Definitely especially balanced. Especially compared to like. If you want to talk about like a Paso big boy, this, sure. this still ain't hitting. But this, this is our big boy. boy. This is ours though, for sure. 14.9% uh, alcohol, uh, about 10 months in barrel. I don't think I used any new oak on this one. Uh, pretty big tannin, and what, I got double gold from? Double gold at Central Coast, gold at uh, Orange County Fair. Okay. And um, on... I think I want to say on September 12th, we can release that it got a 94 from Wine Enthusiast. But, uh, oh, wow. you know, if this podcast just happens to go out before then, I just caveat, we were we were going to wait until then before it's, we said it's anything. A, it, it. It's my fault. <laughs> it, it got released too early. <laughs> so congrats. 94. Very nice. Yeah, very nice. Bad. Very nice. So the counterpart, there's two, there's four wines that have kind of their counterparts. There's the Western Block and the Eastern Block. Okay. Right here, and we okay. spell block, B-L-O-C, you know, you got your, you got your east and west here, and on there, that's a, um, a map of past the Robles, and the red, this is the east side, and the red, and the blue, blue. is the west side. The west side. And for me, I like, I prefer, I like my roads from the west side, so the Colbert Vineyard is in the Adelaide District, and he planted us, uh, Sarah Gracia, specifically for Dayton and Pedro Yemenes, which we have the largest planting oh. of Pedro in the United States. I didn't even know there was Pedro here. There is no. There is no. <laughs> yeah. And actually, there's there's quite a bit out there. I was out there today looking at the uh, looking at the vineyard, and I was like, oh, that's a lot of Pedro. I'm like, who fault this? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. What can I start doing? What can I start doing? Well, we're gonna make a a, a fortified. Okay. It's not going to be exactly a sherry, but it's going to be probably... Well, uh, legally, I can't well, be. Well, it's, <laughs> it's not even going to be We don't want to get anything else style. in trouble. <laughs> it's going to be a uh, much higher sugar alcohol. It's going to be about 18 17.5%. Uh, it's, a, it's a style very popular in uh, the Swan Valley, in Western Australia. Um, and I've done a few of these wines, similar ones for uh, Everly. I did a uh, Muscat liqueur, Viognier liqueur, and Verdello liqueur. Mm -hmm. Verdella was the first. Yeah. Verdella was the first. One of those balls exploded recently. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Adds a little bit. Adds a little bit. Unfiltered. Unfiltered. Very good. Right. You've got to be careful. Fire back up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so while we're talking about the Eastern versus the Western wines or whatever, um, you talked about the Colburn uh, vineyard. What other vineyards are you getting your fruit from? So uh, within Past Robles, we just have two vineyards. Uh, Colburn on the west side, Adelaide District, and then um, uh, Stillwaters in the El Pinar District, and that's where we get all our Porgos. So Sauvignon Blanc, um, Cab Merlot, and then we're going to do a little bit of Semillon this year, which is oh technically it. on the west side, but it's a really small percentage of the blend. We're going to do a um, SBS, so Sauvignon Blanc Semillon blend, which is very popular in Mark River. Um, and I, I, I love that blend, and so uh, I've been wanting to do it for a while. Originally, that's what I wanted the Sauvignon Blanc to be, but right. we couldn't find any Semillon until recently. Yeah, I think that that's a good point of like coming kind of back full circle a little bit on on wanting to start this this brand compared to just working at Everly being the winemaker is that Chris is able to do something like this where, you know, I mean, at Everly we've been around for over 40 years. And, we, we do quite a few different SKUs there, probably too many, but it, you can't just keep adding more, you know, it's, especially whites, you know, we've already got, what, four, 
well, three dry whites. And plus Six the different white varieties. Yeah. Seven. But then within there, you know, some years I'll do a liqueur, I'll do a, a cane cuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll like having, ways. having Everly kind of, we're, you know, you're, you're stuck in your ways a bit there, right? Of, of the customers expect, you know, Chardonnay right. being a, a, a white rum blend. You know, if you branch out with something like that, you know, are you going to replace something that's already on the mainstay list? And it's kind of hard to do. So with, with detente, you know, Chris can come up with these, you know, fun different blends or, hey, I want to work with this fruit that, that we don't normally get to work with. Um, and, and some of that is, you know, Gary Everly is, is, is a hard line on the sand that all fruit must be pastoral as ABA fruit. Some things don't grow phenomenally well in Paso. That's you know we have our varieties that do grow very well here, but uh, you know things like Pinot, they don't grow great here. There's some you know planted throughout, but it, it's not not what Paso is known for, right? And so you know that's something Chris can go around, and we can we can find different vineyards outside the area and play around with some different different climates, different fruit. You said that very delicately. That was nice. You did that what? beautifully. You know, I mean, there are people who have Pinot here, you know. It's, oh, I'm not saying, you yeah. know, so there's some, there's some Paso Pinot out there I think is very good. I just, sure. in, in terms of, of how we make our Pinot of that, that cool climate, delicate style, I, I think isn't showcased in Paso as much as, as we like to do that. Absolutely. So, yeah. It, it's just a bit bigger. It's a bit more okay. fruit bomb, you know, and, and, and I just, there's nothing wrong with that. You so, said it in a way that you're not going to hurt anyone. I right. hope not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I when we started to when we began with Chenin Blanc, oh, right? Yeah. That's one of those varieties that is grown in Paso. And the way we explain it is to our palate, it's not Chenin for us. There's mm-hmm. wonderful Chenin out there in Paso and people do a great job with it in Paso, but we prefer a different type of Chenin. So we went to Clarksburg. Yeah. Oh, right. no, absolutely. Right. How did you find out about Clarksburg, Shannon Blanc? Because they do great Shannon oh. Blanc. There. It's called drinking a lot of Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's Research. R&D. Research. R&D. Yes, absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. Um, but we had gone there, and after we uh, contracted there, uh, there was there a was, um, uh, podcast uh, with Gary on it and he was Gary like Gary Everly? Yep. Wow. And he, he was like you can grow a lot of stuff in Paso but Shen no 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 I take that back but not Shen <laughs> yeah, like- and that was like oh, he, he, he'll tell the same story about uh, you know him planting he planted Shannon when he was at Australia back in 76 or whatever and uh, he's like just the worst mistake ever made is planting Shannon in Paso Robles <laughs> yeah uh, but I always do say there there is some wineries here who do make a very yeah, sure, nice Shannon. Sure. There's a very good Shannon. It's just so within Paso we have those two vineyards and and uh, Stillwaters is a great. He's first of all he's a great guy. Oh yeah, um, oh, yeah. Amazing, no, but... he's, he's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> love you. I hear he's not a good fisherman. guy. I hear he's not a great fisherman though. No, no, no. He just uh, got his commercial fishing license, so now he can sell his. Uh, Catch of the day at the winery. Oh wow! So I think he's shifted focus, maybe away from the wine a little too much into it. Well, now that he got a new winemaker, he's like, oh, right. yeah, he does everything. I don't have to do anything. It's gonna go fish during harvest. Oh, yeah. oh, there'll be times that it's like we're gonna pick the next morning or something. I'll call Paul. Hey man, we're gonna drop in. Great, I'm not fishing. <laughs> hey, like you're in the ocean, man. Like, we're gonna pick tomorrow morning. Yeah, no, we're fine. We're fine. All, right. All good. Yeah. All good. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. That's fantastic. Um, so, the the classified Grenache Pinot. You this is saying twenty six percent Pinot, and you're doing it as a field blend. So, like, can you just explain to listeners and viewers, um, like, how you go about working a field blend? So, you already said that a field blend is you're harvesting at the same time and it goes together. But how do you actually process that if it's two different? So it's, uh, so the Western Block is a field blend. This, oh, I'm sorry. This is just a straight up blend. Oh, okay. This is also a field blend. So this is from the same vineyard, the Rosé and the Western Block. Oh, okay. Block. Um, so the Rosé is actually quite easy. Like if you have fruit that's a little underripe, eh, no big deal. So I just kind of take, you know, the average of the, the three blocks and then try and, you know, pick the perfect day. Uh, when it comes to the field blend of the Western Block, I gotta wait that out a little bit longer. So I've got 
Graciana at the bottom of the hill, then we've got Sarab, then we've got Grenache. And so I'm typically picking the Grenache closest to the, to the Sarab Graciana. And luckily, they're not too far off. Like, if I picked all of them individually, they'd probably be within less than a week. Oh, okay. So, um, I mean, we just got lucky that it all works out that way. But I can wait on the Grenache. I mean, thick skins, you know, it's fine. The straw, not so much because the birds like to eat that. So it's, yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of looking at the Grenache as my like pick point. Okay. Um, and then the Graciano has got great acid, but the flavors might not be there. So um, I'm mostly waiting on the the Graciano and the straw, but the straw is my main, my main one, and um, pick it all together and hope for the best. Hope for the best. <laughs> And so what do you think each of those varieties, varietals do to that wine? Oh, that's pretty easy. Uh, Grenache, that's your, your aromatics. Um, I mean, straw's got the aromatics too, but it adds a little more of that meatiness. Um, and the straw's also kind of the backbone for me. The Graciano's massive color and acid. So really, all of those three varieties really balance each other out pretty well. Fantastic. All right, and then your Pinot, uh, you had mentioned, is actually from the from Santa Barbara? This particular, the Margo Pinot here is from Santa Maria. Uh, oh, Santa Maria. So Hills I don't here. read a website well. Uh, <laughs> well it, it changes every year. You're oh, all, okay. You're also not wrong, though, because okay. the classified has Pinot from Santa Barbara. Okay. So, you, yeah, you probably read thanks the, for the Thanks for covering me. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, no, the Margo Pinot, yeah, is uh, Solomon Hills uh, Vineyard in Santa Maria. We used to get our Pinot from Stolo Vineyard over in Cambria. The fruit was phenomenal. Great. And Great. They, you know, they've been getting bigger and more popular, and uh, you know, we used to get one, one and a half, two tons from them. And, and towards uh, the end of, of that life cycle, they were getting big enough where they just said, "Hey, you know, we we can't we can't end up selling any of our fruit anymore. Uh. We need to take it all." We were. We were pretty bummed about that because it was it was a great source, you know. I mean, it, it wasn't super cheap, but um, the quality we got was incredible. And you know, we they were organic, organic or, but they're pretty close to yeah, it. yeah. And they were great people to work with. So since then, we've pretty much jumped around for a while. We went to Solomon Hills in Santa Maria. The twenty Pinot is from uh, Munns Vineyard up in Santa Cruz Mountains. Oh, okay. And I love Pinot you know, from Santa Cruz Mountains. Yeah. And then 2021 was from um, our new Slow Post Vineyard, which we should be able to get consistently. And it's as close physically to Stolo as we could probably get. Closer. Yeah. Yeah. Although that drive into the valley and back up is, takes quite a while. Yeah. You can see the ocean from from the vineyard we get our pita from. Now. It's oh. Pretty amazing. It's beautiful. Views. Okay. Yeah. It is 100 percent organic, although it's not certified. I think they're going for the certification. Yeah. It takes about three or four years, something like that. Ah, it takes a while, yeah. Um, but uh, we did make it in 2020, but the fruit was so heavily affected by the smoke that we couldn't, we couldn't yeah. use it. Uh, so 21 will be our first edition. We'll continue making paint from that vineyard from here on out, and that'll be the Margo label. Well, what we were lucky with, too, is, is 21 being our first vintage from that La Manzanita uh, vineyard is they just got accredited for the slow coast ABA. So oh. we were able like right before we went to go to bottle it, it was like, Oh, they got approved. We could put it on there and we could get label approval for it. And it was, it was, it's awesome to have that, you know, probably one of the first in bottle with that, that label on it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. Now I think you had, um, another high score. Just recently, right? Uh, Rosé, uh, 93 points in Wine Enthusiast. And we can say that uh, legally. Yeah. We have passed our, our quarantine time of... Uh, this one's coming out, I think, in the October issue, and then that Western Block yeah. Store's coming out in the November issue. So. Oh, okay. But I'm gonna, not going to lie. I didn't know there was a quarantine thing. As soon as they send me that email... I'm I'm on social media. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I technically, I don't think I don't think anybody that. really like keeps. But they're not going to check up on you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they they probably don't. Yeah, don't uh, care too much about it. I get it's that email. It's a small little blurb in the in the yeah. email. That, that's a, like oh, a, is it? A, it's well, like a little asterisk. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I see the email. My hands right like oh no, oh no, and I'm like woohoo! <laughs> social media. <laughs> <laughs> 
But like 93 in a rosé, I was like, oh, That's yeah. pretty impressive. I was like, oh, that's okay. But then you go to look at all the scores for rosé throughout the year. The highest score they gave was a 94. Four, so right. Like, oh, wait, that's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. so yeah. There, and, what, there's something right? against rosé yeah. about yeah. giving giving those 98s or, you know, 96 or whatever. They yeah. just, Which they is just... kind of crazy because yeah. rosé is, is a, a far more technical wine than, you know, all the other still wines. So yeah. I think it you know, definitely deserves its credit. Yeah. Well, it's Not, 93 is so huge. Much, yeah, that yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is huge. That is huge. And then, so I also saw that you have another kind of label, uh, the Series 3, which is... Oh, the Experimental Series. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's the Experimental. Series. So... So every year, to make things kind of fun for our club members and stuff, uh, we do an Experimental Series. Uh, this is the third one. So it's a Tarantes made in a uh, Vino Verde style. Oh. So it's spritzy, it's low alcohol, the bottle says 12, but it's really like 11. Or something like that. Um, nice acid, super refreshing wine. The first experimental series was Montepulciano. Montepulciano. Oh, I just came back from Abruzzo. So what oh, Montepulciano your... del Abruzzo or ah. Montepulciano? Well, I was in. So when I was in Germany, I went to um, Trentino, and I was there for like two weeks, and most of the table wines were Montepulciano. Mm -hmm. So good. And uh, I was like, if I ever get to make this, I'm going to do it. And we found some at um, Salada so Vineyard yeah. in San Benito, which is organic. Yeah. And um, the weirdest thing, when I was making this wine, I would actually, you know, I'd get in the bin and I'd just, you know, stomp it. I'd swim around it in. And that's how I do my punch downs and stuff. It had this smell. I couldn't figure it out. It's like, unlike anything I'd ever smelled before, it was like curry. It finally like occurred to me. I was like, "This smells like curry." I love curry. I love Indian food. Yeah. And you can actually like, it's not the main aroma in the wine, but it's like, if I say curry to you, and you're like, "Oh my god, that's, that's it's it, in there." Right. Yeah. So I, I still love that wine. I think most of our, especially our cellar club. Oh man. One of our most club, popular. Love it. So I'm probably yeah. gonna have to make it again. And we tried to get some more fruit from them this yeah, last they're year. Sold out. Super sold out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when it's something good, it goes quickly, right? Yeah. yeah. And it was like 13.5% or 13% alcohol. Yeah, 13 and a half, 13 3, something like that. Wow. It was, yeah, it was good. And then the second one was a uh, carbon carbonic maceration Grenache. Oh, nice. And that sold pretty well. Yeah, well, I think we just sold out a couple months ago of it. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And so we had to do a wipe, and so we we found some Torontos. Oh, and I'd never worked with it before, but many of them. Yeah. Um, the Vino Verde style wasn't actually on purpose, uh, but the, the damn fruit just wouldn't ripen. Oh. So I think it only got up to like 20 breaks, oh. and it had been sitting at 20 for like three weeks. I was like, ah, let's just pick it. And, uh, you know, I, as I was fermenting it, I was still unsure of what I was going to do. <laughs> and then, like, and then, so across the street at Robert Hall, they make a Vino Verde style called, uh, oh, what's it called? You've, have you had it? Uh, I don't think so. It's, it's okay. Paso Verde. I think oh, okay. it's oh, nice. Amanda, uh, one of the winemakers over there, right. um, that was her idea. She uh, she makes a fantastic Pinot you know, Verde style wine. And I was like, I'm going to copy you. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that's there it is. That's awesome. That is awesome. So tell us where people can find you. First on social media. Absolutely, you... yeah. Definitely on Instagram. Um, Tessa runs our Instagram. Okay. She does an amazing job. You know, we try to be a little bit different as well. Uh, same with our branding and our website and, and our shtick. You know, we, we, we don't want to just take all the same pictures of everybody else. We like to do some fun things. And uh, so Instagram, we're just at Detente Wines. Um, and website, DetenteWines.com. Go check out our, our fun website and you can order there. And then our tasting room is uh, right in the heart of downtown Paso. So downtown down North North Alley. Alley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can find, if you could smell barbecue, follow your nose to Jeffrey's, walk through the restaurant towards the back, and we'll be right here in the corner waiting for you. You could have like a toucan, like, you know, like toucan Sam for follow your nose. It always <laughs> knows. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was awesome talking to you. And for those of you who are listening, it is D-E-T-E-N-T-E -E -E is how it is spelled. So thank you very much, and I wish you guys the best of luck because, you know, your wines are awesome, you know, so 
we know uh, it's going to be awesome. And uh, I'm going to see if I can steal a tasting room next to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need more neighbors down the alley. Yeah, definitely. Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoytbud. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe to help others find me more easily. And most importantly, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. Music is Wine by Kevens. Until next week, slancha. That was no brandy, that was no martini, Irish coffee.